I want to uh, tell you, of course, that we're trying to launch the white paper on inequalities and unmet needs in the detection of atrial fibrillation and the use of therapies to prevent AF-related stroke in Europe. And I'm going to ask Ed Harding from the Health Policy Partnership to tell you a little about this in a moment. But it just strikes me that one of the main reasons that atrial fibrillation has been such a poor relation is firstly that in the 60s when I was a medical student, 1969 for example, uh, when you remember man first stepped on the moon, when Concord broke the sound barrier, when the Beatles sang in their last public performance, when Prince Charles was made the Prince of Wales, and when I was qualifying in medicine, atrial fibrillation was just an alternative, normal rhythm, particularly in the elderly. We knew nothing about it. Now we know a lot about it, but the one thing we've not managed to change is the name of the thing. And most patients find it difficult to remember the name. They find it impossible to spell the words. And importantly, it doesn't ring out as a problem that needs any kind of help. But it really does. Its original name was a Latin name. It was called Pulsus Irregularis et Inequalis. That simply meant an uneven and irregular pulse. Now those were in the days when doctors needed to keep medicine a mystery. So they used Latin terms so you couldn't understand it at all. Today we've recognized that mysteries don't work. We need everyone to know about these problems and this report is going to help with that. So, Ed, I would like to invite you now to tell us a little bit about this report, which is formally launched today. Ed. Thank you very much, Professor Cam. My name is Ed Harding. I'm Managing Director of the Health Policy Partnership. Uh, it's a huge privilege to be here today to very briefly describe what's in the white paper, uh, why it might be of interest to you, and how we can use it. Uh, and to do so, on behalf of uh, Trudy Loban uh, of the AFA and my colleagues, who unfortunately was not able to do this uh, today. Um, it is quite an interesting time, as you say, to be in the Houses of Parliament talking about heart rates, <laughs> uh, which I'm sure are elevated in many places. But equally, as you point out, um, whatever is going to happen and wherever we are going, uh, no single issue could arguably be of greater importance to the absolute <coughs> fundamental discussion on health system sustainability. Um, it's our privilege to work in a lot of different areas of chronic disease, uh, patient-focused care, uh, you name it, but it is rare that you come across an argument so utterly compelling as is the one around the prevention of stroke and atrial fibrillation. Um, we are writers and researchers, and it was a huge privilege, however, to work with an international group of experts, including the World Heart Federation, European Stroke Organization, as mentioned, Professor Cam here today from St. George's University Hospital in London, uh, Trudy Loban, as mentioned, from the AFA, and also our colleague Sotiri Santini of his consultant, pharmacist at Bart's Health NHS Trust, along with many other experts and patients. Our thanks also to the Pfizer and BMS Alliance for funding this work and for allowing us to provide the research and secretariat to it and to uh, help us engage with these international consensus experts who I described previously. The white paper is, I would argue, an invitation, and it's an invitation to look at this incredible opportunity of atrial fibrillation in stroke prevention. 1.2 million people in the UK uh, have atrial fibrillation, it is believed today, and over 400,000 of those are believed to be currently undiagnosed. That's quite an astonishing figure. Often in health policy debates, the issue is understanding what it is that we do in the scientific consensus. However, that's not the issue. We know what it is that we have to do from a clinical perspective. We are working out how we actually do it, how we implement this at scale. And that is the focus of this white paper. Um, it comes at a very critical moment in strategic health decision making. We are not the only country, nation, region, 
to be wondering how on earth we're going to make ends meet in future. Um, therefore, within this white paper, we have set out four clear areas for action that we argue will deliver very, very tangible results. One, we need to really cement the heart and brain link in the general public and the awareness of atrial fibrillation and its link to stroke, the link between the heart and the link between the brain. We need to also empower those who are living with atrial fibrillation to understand their condition, the treatments uh, they are prescribed, and to engage in the decisions that have been taken about them and to express their wishes. We also need to, to adapt clinical practice to enhance AF detection. All too often, as we heard, AF is, is either not diagnosed or diagnosed too late, uh, usually at the point of a stroke. However, extremely cost-effective and simple methods can help to ensure that patients who might have atrial fibrillation are identified and brought to the attention um, of doctors for further analysis. Three, we also need to recognize, as we heard, that following specialist guidelines can be difficult for many healthcare professionals. For example, GPs, nurses, general medicine, and others. We need to find ways to make the guidelines much more accessible and easier to follow. Less of the domain of cardiologist specialists in that area. Finally, four, we need to understand and promote accountability amongst decision makers and in parliaments and governments as to effective uh, policies on air and stroke. There can be no justification for the lack of a formal position on this issue. What is its prevalence? What is its cost? Where is it going? And what questions does that raise for our national health systems? Whatever that position is, whether it's a strategy, whether it's a plan, it doesn't matter. But there can be no justification for the lack of that. Finally, again, as mentioned, this is an international piece of work. I would offer this from personal experience. All healthcare systems across Europe and internationally are learning how to solve these problems. As we heard, it's a new, it's an evolving issue. I think it's a great opportunity to listen and learn to the consensus that we're seeing from our colleagues across Europe. I hope you enjoy reading it.